I'm your host, Victor Broden, and my guest is Ben Ziegler, Unreal Engine Consultant. Awesome. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Asset Manager. Um, ben, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah, I just want to talk through the Asset Manager. This is something that's been requested a few times. Uh, pretty programmer focused, but also like designers and anyone who's interested in kind of the more kind of like more depth of the engine will be interested. Just a few slides I want to start out with, just kind of just talk through the basics of it. Yeah, so the Asset Manager. Before we go too, we go too far into that, I just want to give a quick intro for myself. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Ziegler. Uh, I am with my, you know, my email address and my Twitter handle. Uh, I originally developed the Asset Manager when I was a full-time Epic engineer a few years ago. Now I'm working as an independent contractor uh, exclusively with the Unreal Engine, and I also help out by contributing directly to the engine sometimes. My experience is kind of half gameplay and then kind of half in the more core parts of the engine. Uh, and then, you know, the relevant part for this discussion is I worked on both Epic internal games, on the engine gameplay framework, you know, blueprint team. And I also worked on the action RPG sample, which I was on here a few years ago to talk about. So what is the asset manager? Uh, so it's a single global object. It's very much like an engine subsystem, which is kind of a newer concept, but it's a little bit older than an engine subsystem, but just, per, it just treat it like an engine subsystem. Uh, it's not map or mode specific. There's only one of them, even if you're in the editor or in the game, there's only one. Uh, one of the main things it does is it categorizes and queries unloaded assets using something called the asset registry, which I'll get into in a second. It also maintains a global asset loading state, uh, which, is, um, which means it, it keeps track of which things are in memory and which things are not in memory. Uh, and it also like, integrates a bunch of like, existing systems that were kind of like spread out. So it talks to the cooking system, it talks to the async loading system, and I, obviously the asset registry, like I mentioned. Um, it's also designed to be uh, overridden and extended by individual games. So it's kind of designed with like, a little bit of game-specific extensibility in mind. So I mentioned the asset registry. Uh, so the asset registry is used for a bunch of things, not just the asset manager. Uh, the main thing it's used for is powering the content browser in the editor, uh, which you know, keeps track of like, all of your meshes, all of your textures, all of everything. Uh, it does this by storing information about assets that are saved, even if they're not in memory. So it can know about all the meshes in your entire game. Uh, it, when you load your editor up, it actually refreshes that off of like a disk cache, which if you've ever like loaded the content browser and you see like a progress bar in the corner, that is the asset registry, like loading up all the information off of the disk. Uh, for the asset, so, the other thing it has is it has a key and value map for every single asset that allows you to store kind of arbitrary data in the asset registry at save time, which you can then read back later on. And the asset manager is like, takes advantage of that capability. Um, most of the data stored in the asset registry is also available in a cooked or packaged game, uh, but not all of it is. We'll get into that a little bit. We will get into that a little bit later, uh, and it also provides the like data storage for the asset manager's internal systems. Okay, so the asset manager. Why does it exist? This is actually kind of a hard question to answer. We were talking about how to describe the asset manager and what the purpose of it is. And it's actually a little bit complicated because when you're just making a prototype game or you know, a very map-based game where you go from the first map to the second map and it's very like static, you don't really need an asset manager. You need an asset manager when you're going from that static prototype into a more complicated game that has a lot of different things that kind of like interact with each other or you need to know about from like other places. It's especially important if you're making like a role-playing game or something like a roguelike where there's a lot of different types of things uh, so this came about originally because we were making a game like that with lots of things in it. Uh, we started with something called the object library, which is used in a few places still, but it's kind of like an older version of the asset manager. 
uh, that just kind of like keeps track of a very specific list of objects and lets you read information about them from the asset registry. But that was kind of limited because we wanted to keep track of a lot of different types of things, you know, like weapons and uh, you know, like potions and all sorts of things like that. So the other problem with that is the blueprint classes work a little differently than other assets, and they're kind of a pain to work with sometimes. So the asset manager kind of hides that complexity. Uh, it also helps deal with long load times and high memory usage. Because the other way you can avoid having an asset manager is if you just load everything into memory at the startup of your game, then you don't really need one. But also you're wasting a lot of memory, and then your load times will be like minutes long at the beginning of your game, and no one wants that. Uh, the other thing is we were trying to move from a lot of cases using hard U object references and kind of loading those uh, when you need them. Uh, but that is a problem because that can also that can often cause really bad stalls in your game. Like you might just go try to do something and you have to wait like five seconds for it to react. And players hate that. Like no player likes that. So we were trying to move away from that. And the asset manager was a tool we used to do that. Uh, another thing we wanted to support is when you're going from like your main menu into your game, or you're like on a client and a server, you need to load different types of data. And that is kind of hard to track. So we wanted to have a system that can handle tracking that for us. Then the last important thing it does is it ties into the uh, sort of packaging and chunking system, which just decides which files things end up in on your final platform, on your console or your mobile device or on PC. Uh, so that was also a complicated manual system that the asset manager is just designed to interact with. So there's a few kind of like big components to talk through. Uh, I guess the first thing is what is a primary asset? So a primary asset is anything you would talk about as being the top level thing. So a map, like a, like a level, is a primary asset because you can talk about it from anywhere in the game. But you also might have other primary assets like weapons or potions or you know, up to 50 different types of primary assets depending on what your game needs. So there's one type for basically every single class. So there's a potion type, a weapon type, a map type. Uh, and then there's also a, a identifier or just called primary asset ID uh, which is one of those for every single asset that you need to categorize. Uh, there's also this concept of rules. Rules are basically sort of like the rules. Uh, do you apply to different types of primary assets? It could be for cooking or for chunking or for management. I'll get into those. I will get into those a little bit later. Uh, there's a settings, which also is very game specific, which lets you set how you load and use each of the primary assets. And then it's not, this isn't a formal type, but we talk about secondary assets because they're anything that's not a primary asset. So that's like textures or meshes, because you don't normally say like load a texture. You say like, oh, this texture is in a material, which is in a mesh, which is in a character. So I, most things in the game end up being secondary assets. Right, so to make a primary asset type, uh, the easy way to do that is you just subclass uh, you primary data asset, which you can do from both a native class or just in the blueprint editor. Uh, that kind of does all the work for you. Uh, you can also prototype with any asset you want uh, using some settings that I'll get into in a second. Uh, but you need to kind of adjust your settings if you want to use that method because it's a little slower. So we kind of pre it's preferred to use primary data asset or something like it. Uh, then you set the scan options, which I'll show you. Uh, and then the default um, behavior is that the, the, the identifier will use the short name of your asset. So if, you're, if your asset is just called like Weapon Axe, but it's in a really long path, it'll just be called Weapon Axe. It won't be called the huge path Weapon Axe. So that allows you to kind of keep track of things, but it also means that you're generally not allowed to use the same name in different directories for primary assets. Uh, and then now we're going to jump over to a bit of example. This is using the action RPG sample, which is available in the launcher. Uh, this is a sample we put out a few years ago to try to like illustrate how to use 
some of the more complicated parts of the engine, like you know, like the asset manager. Uh, and it's like it's an actual small scale RPG. Okay, so here is action RPG. Uh, just to give you a real quick look at what it is, I'm just going to play it for a second. Oh, sorry, ignore that. Okay. So it's a simple top-down kind of Diablo-like game designed for both mobile and controller. So you can see we have a weapon, we have an attack, there's enemies. Uh, and then as you play this, you actually get to sort of unlock new abilities and new weapons. And each of those weapons ends up being a primary asset that the asset manager cares about. So going over to our content browser, uh, here's the sort of assets in the game. Uh, and then over here in items are the primary assets. So let's look at a weapon. Uh, and each of these directories is its own type. So like skill is a type, uh, tokens are a type, weapons are a type. Here's an example, axe. Uh, so this has, you know, has like a, an actor that spawns when you equip the weapon, has some like, you know, inventory information, uh, and then kind of like an, a gameplay ability that grants, which we talked a little bit about, I think last week or a few weeks ago. But the, the, the um, action RPG kind of shows how you might use abilities from the asset manager. Uh, for this example that we're doing, I actually added a few new fields. Uh, that I'll show you in code in a second. Uh, but the inventory texture is an example of something that you may want to only have in the inventory menu, you know, in the inventory menu, like you don't need it in game. Uh, you know, this pickup sound is the sound, you don't, you don't need this in the menu because you only need to play that sound when you're in the game and pick it up. Uh, this is another uh, primary asset that you can just pick off of a menu. And this will only give you the primary assets that exist in your game. So these are all the ones that you can select from. And this is an example data registry tag field, which I'll explain later. So this is how you make a primary asset. Uh, but then how do you use them? So the uh, Action RPG has a few simple examples of that. The game instance has it. So here we're looking at the uh, game instance uh, of the action RPG sample. So this is code that runs whenever you play the game. In this case, this initialized store items runs at kind of the beginning of the, of the game session. So what this does is it goes through a list of uh, just kind of like item slots that are set up. And the key in this map is a primary asset type. So like weapon, potion, et cetera goes through that, gets the type out of that, and then it calls an asset manager function that gets every single primary asset that is of that type. And then it, it starts an asynchronous load of all those assets. So this will actually take you know, multiple seconds in theory. Uh, then once this is completed, that will hit this sort of like completed uh, pin here. And you can see that from the, uh, the clock here, the clock means that this is a slow operation that will take multiple seconds. And once that's done, it will actually, then it iterates over all of the um, items that loaded off disk. And then it can, uh, you know, kind of like cast them to a type and then it adds these to the UI basically. So then the UI knows all of the items that exist in the game. And then it can show them in a list without having to like hard code a bunch of paths to all of your items. The other thing this does is this calls a uh, kind of like hacky example function I just added for this stream, uh, which I will talk about in one second. Okay, so that's how you kind of use it. In, oh, I forgot a step. The other important part is setting up your settings. So that is just available from the project settings. Uh, there's an asset manager section on the left. Uh, it's a little hard to read this, so I'm going to kind of walk through this. But um, let's find a weapon. Here's a weapon. So this is the type definition for the weapons we just looked at. So you pick the class uh, that it is. 
uh, to say that it's blueprinter only. The editor only is used, in this case, for maps. I think maps are editor only. Yeah, so an editor only type is one that, that is not available in a cooked game. So you can categorize it, but only as far as like the cooking stuff, not as far as the in-game querying. Uh, this directory is a list of where to load it from. So in this case, this, this was uh, selected out of you know, the directory where we had all the weapons stored. Uh, these rules, I will talk about a little bit later. But this is, yeah, I'll come back to rules in a second. And then outside of this uh, types array, there's a few other kind of global options. You can actually set up some like specific overrides here, uh, which will allow you to, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, hmm. Then down here are some options that kind of like allow you to use the prototype settings. So by default, the editor will just kind of like use these settings up here and trust you know what you're doing. But in a cooked game, that actually won't work unless you hit this little option here, uh, which says, don't listen to the items, listen to the asset manager when, when deciding uh, what type an item is. Again, this is a little bit slower, so we don't turn it on by default. But if you're doing a Blueprint-only game, uh, this, this will be a useful option. OK, I think that's all the main options. Yeah. All right, going back to the presentation. Okay. So now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of C++. This will, so uh, the next like, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes will be very code heavy. Uh, so you know, if you're a designer, you may not care about this part. We'll get back to more general stuff in a minute. Uh, so the asset manager, again, is kind of like a uh, engine subsystem. So you kind of get it with a global accessor. Uh, there's a bunch of functions on the asset manager, which I'll go over in a second. A common one here is, you know, this basically this git primary asset ID list is the equivalent of the blueprint node I showed before that gets all the different weapons in the game. Uh, this is actually querying the asset registry, uh, which I'll show in a second. Uh, this does a asynchronous load, uh, like the blueprint node I showed before. And this will, in this case, in C++, instead of using the blueprint pins, you actually pass in a delegate function. And then from your delegate function, you can do whatever you want, because it's, it's been loaded into memory. Uh, and then if you use the load function, this will stay in memory for the rest of the game, like the entire, forever. Uh, which is useful for things like items, where you want to load all of them. Uh, but let's just say you don't want to load it forever. You want to get rid of it. Then you can call the unload, and this will let it be released on the next garbage collection. You, this will not immediately release it. And if something else is holding on to that asset, it will not get released either. But this is you need to do this if you want to like switch game modes entirely and throw away all your old stuff. And then instead of using the like permanent load here, you can also use a preload. Uh, and this kind of returns a handle. Uh, and this, this will only keep things loaded as long as this handle is stored somewhere. And I'll show you that when we go over to the code in one second. Yeah, uh, one big concept to talk about here is you see how there's current load state here? Uh, this is a list of bundles asset bundles. And this is a kind of a more advanced concept. They, not every game needs these. So it's totally fine just to pass in like an empty array for those functions. But an asset bundle is what you use to support multiple game modes, like menu, in-game, and client and server. Uh, you can do this by like setting up uh, meta tags on the actual U properties in your C++ asset. Uh, and that says like this, that exposes it to the system. There's also like a C++ function on primary asset data you can override. Um, and then there are, some C, there are basically some functions in the asset manager that let you change the global state. So you can say, uh, you, can, like, you can like do a query to find all the weapons in the game. And then you can say, change all the weapons from menu mode to in-game mode. And that would like release the menu textures, but start to load the in-game sounds. Uh, you can also do this by uh, 
You can also do this by um, using another function it's called change bundle state for everything. And then that will basically let you change the state for everything in your game. So that would be for like a very large change. Um, before I jump over to C++, I think now's a good time to kind of talk through some sort of like general loading best practices, because it's kind of tied to bundles and a few of those other things. And I'll kind of show those off a little bit when we go look at the code. Uh, but like I mentioned before, synchronous loading is a bad thing to do in general. Uh, a synchronous load is when you call just like a load object call from C++. There's a few blueprint nodes that do this. Um, the game, this could take a really long time. Like this could take seconds. And during those seconds, your user is, is, sees nothing. So like it might look like the game has crashed. In some cases, it actually might fail a certification for you on console platforms. Um, this is a really bad experience to, to do that. So the general rule that I like to use is only do this during load screens. Or you can sometimes get away with doing like fast ones if it's in response to like user input. So like if the user has just changed a setting, uh, they're okay if it takes like a second or two to apply that setting because they know what's going on. They know that they press the button. Oh, okay, something is happening. It's probably because I changed the setting. Uh, but it's, so that's okay. But obviously, if it goes too long, it might be a problem again. But you, you basically never want to have a random stall of more than you know, a frame or two in the middle of your gameplay, because it just feels broken to the user. Uh, I mentioned that the asset bundles. So the asset bundles are a good way to handle loading screens. So that's usually where you would uh, change the bundle state and clear caches and like release things. Uh, so you don't normally mess with that while you're in game, unless you're doing something kind of game specific. But in loading screens, you can do whatever you want to. Uh, the, streamable, the streamable handles, like I mentioned, have a bunch of utility functions on them that I'll show you uh, that can be useful for just kind of like managing things going on. Uh, there's kind of like two broad ways to handle soft references when you want to load things. Um, the first way is you can basically say, load this, like asynchronously load this thing, wait for it to finish, and then do a thing. So that's the example I showed in Blueprint, where you, you know, I did the multi-second load and then it called a callback when it was done. So that's good for um, big things or when, you're, when you know you can wait. Uh, there's sometimes, especially in the user interface, where that's not as easy to do. So sometimes you want to use what's called preload and then like a fallback load. So you start a preload when you like enter a new menu. But then, like, it may not finish in time. Like, you, the user may be clicking really fast, and they may break through your like preload. So, in some cases, we do have like a preload, and then you fall back to a synchronous load. Those are the two like general ways I would say it's good to do loading. Uh, this kind of like a this is like a next one's kind of one that just keeps coming up whenever I contract. Uh, so, a lot of programmers really like assigning lambdas to delegates. If you if you don't know what this means, don't worry about it. But if you do know what this means, please don't do that. <laughs> or like, be very careful when you do that, because a lot of people write lambdas that are not safe to execute a few seconds later. So I, I just I don't be very careful when you use lambdas on anything that can happen multiple seconds later. And the last thing I'll mention is we, you know, the samples of existing systems aren't really using all these features to their best. Because well, a lot of stuff was built for internal games, and we moved it into samples later. So Action RPG only uses you know half of the functionality of the system. We everyone knows about this, so we want to do a better job about this in the future. It's something I care about, so we're going to keep working on that. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to we're going to go to C++ now. Sorry, my order is bad. OK, uh, we're going to kind of walk through some actual code here and make it look nice and big. Uh, so here is the function that the blueprint was calling. Again, this is not a real function in the sample. I just wrote this this morning. Uh, it's just kind of showing off some of the things you can do. So like, you know, this gets the list of all of the weapons. This does a uh, asset registry query. Uh, this 
And this basically, when you call this get primary asset data, it fills in this like F asset data structure for you. And then you can query it with a, basically again, it's a key value map. Uh, and then this is actually the example tag I added to the item primary asset. So this is exists in the sample, but these four fields I just added today. Uh, so this example registry tag, you'll see this has the uh, tag, this has the data asset registry searchable on it. And I'm setting it searchable that allows you to query it later on. And then this is the ones I showed in the editor with like the linked primary asset. And then this is how you set up bundles up. So this inventory texture is set to only be in the menu bundle. And then this pickup sound is set to only be in the game bundle. Okay, back to the example code. So this example code goes through all the items in, all the items in the game, uh, grabs this example tag. Uh, this is just a little helper macro that like make sure that this is really defined in the item here. So it finds the tag named this, uh, gets that value and throws it in this F name. And then we just print out the F name as an example. This code here is the same as the blueprint node I showed that just kind of loads the assets. Uh, so we declare the primary asset ID uh, based off this weapon type. And then this, this weapon type is actually defined up in the header for the RPG sample. This is a useful thing to do in general, just to like have these ready to go for your game, because you're going to often need to call these from C++. So it makes a weapon primary asset ID, then it loads it. Uh, and then this is the callback I mentioned. So it basically just binds this uh, function to the callback. So when that load finishes, it gets into this code, uh, which in this case just prints out the name of the thing that loaded and then just unloads it. And then here's uh, the uh, streamable handle I mentioned. Uh, the preload case, uh, like I mentioned, you need to use the handle from this, because if you don't use the handle, it just goes away. Uh, but this handle can kind of be copied around or stored inside like a global object if you want to keep things loaded. And then this is also just has a lot of useful functions on it, like I mentioned before. Uh, so you can see if it's still in, in progress, you can see you, know, you, can get, you can get a name off of it. You can kind of cancel it ahead of time if you're like, oh, I don't care about this, stop loading. Uh, you can change the delegates after it's already started. Uh, and then you can also do wait until complete. This will actually stall whatever thread you're on, stall the game thread until it's done loading whatever's in the handle. Anyway, this, this just gives you more options in your game specific code to do what you want. Uh, I think it's about it for the C++ side of it. Oh, uh, one other minor thing. So this is kind of what the settings end up looking like in like an INI file. So it's actually sometimes easier to read the asset manager settings in the INI, just because there's just, there's just so many fields. So you can kind of either use the in-game interface, or you can use the in-game interface to get you started. And then you can just go into the INI and then change a few things. You would have to restart the editor if you do that, though. I think that's it for C++. We can come back to this later if there are like more coder-specific questions. Take a water. OK. Uh, so this is kind of the loading section of the discussion. Um, now we're going to get over to cooking and packaging. So this is something that a lot of games don't even think about until very late in the process. Uh, and that can be a problem sometimes. So that's why I advise a good time to think about some of the stuff is when you're like turning your prototype into, a, into like a full game and you're getting ready to figure out what platforms you want to ship on. If you want to be on mobile, you want to be on console. Uh, and then the asset manager can be used to like help you tweak the rules for cooking and, and um, shipping. Uh, one thing you can do is you can just override the modify cook function on the asset manager. Uh, there's a bunch of functions on the asset manager, which I'll go to. I kind of at the end, I'll walk through some of those. There's also a finish loading function you can override. This is a good place to just kind of do game-specific stuff. Um, 
because anything that's in memory uh, when the asset manager is done loading will get cooked. You don't, need, you don't even need to reference it. It'll get cooked if it's in memory. So this is a kind of a really easy way to make sure things get cooked. You can also set up cook rules uh, in the INI, in labels, or in, or in the C++ code. And cook rules allow you to kind of override these rules per asset. Uh, and you can do some kind of complicated stuff there. And one thing we want to try to make a little better, we were just talking, it's not super extensible by plugins right now, at least in 426. And we, we know that's something people want. So that's going to, we're trying to figure out ways to do that better. Uh, so, so this is for cooking. For cooking is the process of actually getting things from editor assets into cooked assets, which is kind of like an intermediate step. Because you don't generally run from the cooked assets, you run from the staged assets. Uh, and then chunking is about the transition from cooked assets to staged assets. Uh, gen there's kind of a few different ways to do staged assets. The older method is using .pak files. And there's something called IO store, which is like a newer version of PAK. But the same concepts apply for both. Um, Basically, you have like individual stage files, which will have a bunch of different assets in it, you know, thousands of assets per stage file. Uh, by default, everything goes in chunk zero. Uh, and if you don't have the generate chunks option on, everything goes into zero. It doesn't matter what you do, it'll all go in zero. Uh, but once you enable that option, you might have a chunk zero pat stage file, you might have a chunk one stage file, and so forth, and so on. You can actually kind of make a hierarchy of chunks uh, using a kind of like an INI called the chunk dependency info. Uh, that allows you to say that if something's in both chunk one and chunk two, don't bother putting into chunk two because chunk one is like a higher level chunk. Uh, by default, chunk zero is the highest level chunk. So anything in zero will not get put into a lower level chunk. This can be useful if you're setting up like if you're setting if you're setting up like a platform specific feature where you want some of your stuff to be downloaded at start and some of the things downloaded as you play the game or in certain languages, you may need to set up these dependencies so that it doesn't like duplicate the assets into multiple chunks. And again, you 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 would need this for platform specific features. If you're just shipping on a, on a standard C, standard PC platform with no like special downloader features, you don't actually need chunking. Uh, but if you're on like a mobile platform and your or your game's large enough and you want to do like language specific downloads or texture packs, that kind of thing, then you're going to need to use chunking to like split your assets up. And LC works with the new chunk downloader plugin that was released in 4.26 which I'm not going to go into because it's a whole complicated thing on its own, but that's kind of how you would use the asset manager to decide which chunks things go into on the, for the mobile downloader. Okay, um, like I mentioned, you can kind of set up chunks and cook rules uh, per asset. Uh, so you can assign things directly in the, in the config. So I'll kind of show that. We'll go back to the asset manager config. Okay, so primary asset rules, you could say like uh, for the health potion, we're gonna say that it's a super high priority potion for some reason, and it always goes in chunk two, just cause we're saying that. Uh, so this is kind of like the most specific way you could do that. Uh, recursively doesn't apply in this case because you're setting it to exactly one thing. Uh, but the cook rule says when you should cook it. So you could say never cook, which will actually stop it from cooking. So this is useful if you have like something that you just want to make sure it never gets out ever. Um, always cook, always cook it, always, just always cook it. This, this is uh, useful because you can just put anything you want to in your cook. Uh, develop and cook. This ties into this option where you can say that you have like prototype or development only assets. Uh, and then you could like use that with like a switch to like decide what kind of things go into your final cook. 
Uh, that's like you need to, to use that. You need to turn on this uh, only cook production assets uh, rule here. So anyway, these rules here I mentioned uh, are used throughout the rest of these things I'm about to talk about. Okay, uh, so you can set direct in the config like I just showed you. You can also set up labels, uh, and then you can also override some C++ functions to change how these rules are applied. This is a much more advanced thing that I'll talk about a little bit, but is some of these rules are complicated because the engine is complicated. Um, specifically, it's sometimes hard to tell like what's oh, what owns what. So it's hard to know if a map owns an item or an item owns a map. So that's one of those cases where you might need to change those rules. I'll go through a minor example. So going back to the uh, example, so here is the primary asset rules, like I mentioned. We're actually going to get rid of that because it's not really what we want to do. Uh, instead, I actually set up some labels in the content browser. Okay. Uh, shooter game also has some labels set up. And that's how shooter game does its um, chunk assignment. Uh, so for the action RPG, I've set up a main menu and then a gameplay map label. So in this case, uh, this says that everything that is referenced by the kind of main menu map will be assigned to chunk zero. Uh, and this just does apply recursively. So this says that everything under this will get to chunk zero. And then I set the priority super high in this case because you want everything that it uses to be in the main menu. Uh, then the gameplay map puts everything that's in chunk, everything else in the chunk one. And again, chunk one is you know, a lower priority chunk than zero. And then I also set it up in the config already so that all of the items, like weapons and stuff, are uh, have a chunk ID set to two. So basically, uh, any, any item or potion that's not used directly in one of the maps will end up in chunk two. Uh, yeah, so that's how you set up rules. And I'll show you how you like, look at those in a second. OK, uh, so all these things are kind of hard to get a grip on uh, until you really understand the system. Like, it's kind of hard to do it right the first time. Like, don't expect anyone to do this correctly the first time. Um, so there's some tools that I and some other people built to help you investigate what your assets are doing. First one is the reference viewer, which is a useful thing in general uh, that I'll show you in a second. That allows you to see what assets refer to other assets. Um, you can use, also use the asset audit tool, which is just kind of like a list view of all of your assets, kind of similar to the content browser. Uh, and you have some options you can do on there. Uh, and then there's also the size map, which allows you to get a hierarchy view of all of the assets in your game kind of from the top down, which lets you see what's using that super big texture that you don't want to ship. Um, and that's actually, if you saw the like, in, you know, the, the, the uh, sort of announcement for this, that was the size map, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, so again, these aren't really, these are kind of hard to talk about. So we're just going to go through them. Show me that up. OK, um, so to get to the reference viewer, you can, the easy, easiest way to get there is just find any asset you care about. Uh, so let's go to one of the items. Sorry. Uh, let's go to reference here. I can see this view here. Make it a little bigger. OK. Uh, so this is a useful tool for all sorts of things. This lets you see that the ax is using you know, this uh, gameplay base class, sorry, this ability, uh, this um, actor that spawns, this texture. So these are hard references. You can tell because they have this um, white line 
and they actually, you know, and they say if you disable soft references. These purple lines are soft references. These are the ones I added for the demo that you had to use bundles to load. The other thing you can do is you can turn on management references. Uh, so that should not make these, these should not turn to none. That is a bug in 426 that should be fixed in the future. Um, but you can still kind of see the name above it. So this is the axe. Uh, and then you can see that the axe is managed by this primary asset, weapon colon weapon axe. So that lets you see that this um, individual uh, on disk asset is, you know, like logically owned by this um, primary asset kind of name over here. This, sorry, this primary asset identifier. So this is the actual primary asset identifier. Uh, now, if I click on that, you will see that this is assigned to chunk two. Uh, and that is because of the rules we set up in the um, project settings, where all weapons are assigned to chunk two. So you can kind of, you know, you can kind of use this uh, interface to navigate all around and figure things out. Uh, the next tool that's useful is the data ass the um, Asset audit, you can get to that two ways. You can either just go up here to window, uh, developer tools, asset audit. Oh, it's already open. Or you can actually select the assets you care about, right click them, go to audit assets, and then I'll like put it over here into your audit view. And this is basically just a version of the content browser that is meant for just like looking at things in detail. So you don't, you know, there's no like big images in the way, there's no folders, that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, you can see details about each of these weapons. Uh, you can actually see that the asset registry data just shows up right here. So because I had added uh, to this example registry tag for this particular weapon, that just shows up here. Uh, you can also see what chunk it gets assigned to, the cook rule for it. Uh, this usage is a little complicated. This is just kind of like how many things are using it multiplied by their priority. So it's kind of an abstract concept. It's basically like, how important is this? Bigger numbers are more important. So if it's like a million, it's probably really important. If it's like one, it's probably not important. If it's zero, it's actually just not used at all. Uh, and then this disk size is, what, is how big it is on disk. Um, exclusive means just how big is the actual asset on its own, so which is very small, uh, because these are just like tiny little data assets. Uh, but you know, the disk size overall is all the things it manages. So this includes all of the at the um, textures and meshes used by it. And then here's like, you know, here's the name of it. Um, yeah, from here, you can right click things. And then you can get to the other tools like the reference viewer and the size map. Uh, another very important thing you can do on this view is this drop down over here. Uh, this is probably hard to see, but this is actually selecting which platform you want. So if you have locally cooked for a platform, it will show up here. Uh, or if you haven't, you can actually go to custom. And then you need to find basically the development asset registry file. Uh, so this is described, this, this part is in the documentation. So the details about this part are described in the documentation. Um, but if you go over here and select uh, the cooked platform, uh, that actually switches all these um, all these sizes over here to be the cooked sizes. So these are much more accurate. So the editor sizes, it does its best to like guess how big it'll be, but it's really not that accurate. Uh, but this is how big it will actually be in your data, uh, uncompressed. So it'll be a little bit smaller on disk usually, depending on what you're doing per platform. But the point is you can use this to figure out how big things are. So you can see from this that essentially the axe is like four times as big as the hammer. To see that better, we can use the size map. OK. Uh, so this is uh, that's not a great view, actually. Um, I'll just get all of them. OK, so this is um, looking at all the weapons in the game. This view is kind of hard to understand initially. It's kind of intimidating. Uh, the important part is the bigger the box, the larger it is. 
So, you know, like this particular texture is very large for some reason. This particular sound is very large. You know, but like these textures over here, kind of small, who cares? Uh, so there's a shared section up here. This is all the things that are shared amongst all the weapons. And you can see that there's a lot of things that are shared. And you can actually see this because like the kind of base blueprint weapon actor has references to a bunch of other things. But you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. So I could zoom into like this section of like wave progression data table. And you can zoom back out. On the right here are the individual weapons. So we saw that like Hammer 3 was really big, right? So Hammer 3 happens to have like these three giant textures uh, that add up to like 3.6 megabytes. But like uh, Hammer 1, for some reason, doesn't have any big textures. So this one's tiny. So like Hammer 3 is a thing you should optimize, whereas Hammer 1, you don't need to worry about it. But this is a really easy way to like figure out what kind of textures and meshes should be optimized by your artists. Because artists tend to, you know, it's, or, you, or you can go back to the asset audit view. Because in the asset audit view, in addition to having these primary types that I brought over manually, you can do clear up here. And then you can do add asset class, add all textures in the game. Uh, all 2D textures. Okay, so this is every single texture in the sample. And we're just going to sort by disk size. So we can see that the barbarous character texture is very large. And you can see it's because it's a pretty big normal map for this character. So that makes sense. Um, but then if you go back to the audit, some of these don't make as much sense. Like you might, ah, OK, so here's a good example. Um, in this case, the speed tree game wind noise texture is five megabytes. Uh, I don't know why the speed tree wind noise texture is five megabytes, because it's this. Uh, but yeah, just for some reason, using it's just part of the speed tree importer, apparently. As you can see, the path is in the importer. Um, what else is there? Most of these make sense, though. Like, most of these, you know, like, you know. It's, it's, the texture is a kind of bad example, because I think this, this game actually has been optimized pretty well. But uh, if your game has not been optimized at all, you might find that you have some incredibly enormous like 4K textures that are like plain colors. And you, it's, you don't need that. So this view is a really easy way to like find your like low-hanging fruit for optimization. Uh, the other thing you can do in here is clear everything out and do add chunks. So this just gives you all the chunks in the game. So you have, again, zero is kind of like the main menu and everything that the kind of like game startup needs. One is all the stuff in, actually you can just see easier if I just go into the size map. So one is all the stuff inside this action RPG kind of like main gameplay map. So you can see, you know, this, this map has a lot of textures it uses and so forth. Uh, but like this is this is like the lighting data, right? So the lighting data ends up being pretty big in most maps. Um, and then chunk two is going to be all the individual uh, primary assets that are not included somewhere else. So you know we already saw this view basically, but it's like all the weapons and stuff. Uh, now you might notice that chunk zero is like way is pretty big, right? And you usually want your zero chunk to be small. Um, so from, if you do size map on chunk zero, you can actually see what's going on. So over here, you'll see again, here's this big wind noise texture. Uh, this is not inside a label or anything else. That usually means that the engine is referencing it or something like it's just loaded at startup or something like that. So this might be something you need to fix in C++ code or so forth. So like, you know, here's like the default font. Like you probably need that though. Um, the logo, I think the, I think the loading screen uses this logo. So that's why it's like big and, and not inside anything else. But you can also see that this is the main menu label. Uh, this is all the things that the main menu map needs. And again, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, this also includes like a lot of the base blueprints. 
So this is a good way to figure out if your like base blueprint is huge for some reason. Like the player character is 50 megabytes of total stuff. And you know, that's just, that's probably because like the player character references well actually let's figure it out. So like why is the player character so big? Uh, you can see here that the goblin level one blueprint is referenced by it for some reason. And then you can kind of see back to the reference viewer. Uh, and you see there's a hard reference from the player character blueprint to the goblin blueprint. So that's an example of something that you may not want in your shipping game. Because it's kind of like, you know, because your player is loaded in every scene, but you may not have goblins in every single level. Uh, so this is the kind of thing where you might want to go back later on and use the asset manager to like figure out if maybe you want to add like a enemy primary asset type. And that would allow you to get rid of this like hard dependency on the goblin. Uh, so like, why is the goblin referencing that? Let's just see if it shows up somewhere. It does. Yeah, good example. So in this case, uh, the goblin is in memory because of a debug function. So this is just a function that was added for debugging during development. Uh, so this one, this, this doesn't even work in the actual package game. Uh, you know, this will be false and it will won't do anything. But this blueprint node still exists in the shipping game, and this blueprint node references this goblin. Uh, so yeah, so this this like debug function is resulting in something like 20 megabytes of other extra stuff ending up in chunk zero. So yeah, I mean, your, your game will have a lot of issues like this. Uh, there's a lot of things that can cause hard references. But these kind of references are, again, why we built the asset manager in the first place, was to kind of try to deal with complicated use cases like this, where we don't really want to load everything. Uh, let's go back to the size map and see if there's anything else interesting here. Not really. I mean, like, here's like the player character that's big. Would that make sense? Uh, the Anim Blueprint has some stuff in it. Uh, yeah, again, Action RPG is pretty is reasonably well optimized because we want to make sure we work on a mobile platform. But if you have like a prototype game and you go to like this view, I guarantee you're just going to see like crazy things in it. You're going to be like, oh, here's a, here's like our, our entire game is just one texture. So like it's, it, you can get pretty far in optimizing your game by just using this view to like figure out what's going on. Okay, I think it's all the tool stuff I wanted to talk through. There's a few other options up here, again. So you can add like all the types if, if you want. You can add like every single primary asset if you want. You know, like here's the, all the maps and the weapons and the skills all in one place. Um, let me go back to my presentation. I don't think I have much left. I do, okay, right, okay, a few things. I'm just gonna kind of mention these quickly. Uh, this is just kind of like ideas to think about for advanced programmers. This is not something you want to dive into quickly. Uh, these are kind of things that you can kind of like build on top of the asset manager to do. So you might want to like, for instance, you might have like a lot of complicated things when your game starts up. Most games just start by like referencing everything and loading everything at once. But that may not be something you want to do. You may want to have like a loading bar, you know, like a, like a progress bar or something. So you could like use the asset manager to like build a little mini state machine to give yourself a progress bar. Um, one thing that ended up being pretty helpful is when you do like a map change, uh, you can you so the map change itself is going to be a hard load generally, unless you're using certain things. But most of the time it's going to be a hard load. But you can make that load a lot smaller if you do like a preload of all the assets the map uses. So you could write some like custom game code to do that with bundles or just kind of do manual stuff. Uh, it, is, it is hooked into the chunk downloading system used by the, um, the, new, the chunk downloader plugin I mentioned. So that, that is um, in the Battle Breakers game, a mobile game that we have shipped. That's actually set up to use the asset manager to download chunks off of the web on demand. So you can actually say like async load this character and that'll start a download and then I'll go to the server and download it and then that's, that download will finish and then it'll kind of load back into your game and give you a callback saying, here's your asset, it's now in memory. Uh, again, there's not really a good example of this. Let's go complicated, uh, but all the kind of like plumbing pieces are there uh, you will just have to kind of work through those pieces on your own. 
Uh, there's also some kind of like custom reports, which is a, that's been a useful thing to do. The asset manager has a few kind of built in. And actually, before I go to the Q and A, this is a good time to do one more code, one more code thing. Um, yeah, let's go back to code. This, by the way, this is Visual Assist, which I recommend. <laughs> Okay, so the asset manager header file, like I mentioned, it's kind of complicated, uh, but I try to put good comments on here to explain what's going on. Uh, so there's a lot of virtuals here. Basically, everything is virtual. You can override pretty much everything in here. Uh, so it's kind of like organized by section. So, you know, like it's like, it's like general utilities for getting stuff. Uh, there's like sections for async loading. There's sections for bundle changing. Again, these are very complicated, so they have very long comments. Um, here's some of the stuff for the chunk downloading down here. OK, uh, there's a bunch of general utility functions here. So these are useful for pretty much every game. Uh, so yeah, here are get asset data for path. Like this will just um, give it like an object path a soft object path, which is the same thing as a soft object reference. This just like goes to the asset registry and just gets you the asset data for you. And this kind of like allows you to ignore like redirectors and like blueprint assets, that kind of thing. So all these like utility functions are just kind of designed to be easy to use on purpose. Um, it's kind of the opposite. So like this takes like a asset data, you might get out of the asset registry and tells you like, this gives you a pointer to the actual thing you want, which in the Blueprint case will be a Blueprint class. If you just query the asset registry directly, you will actually get back the editor Blueprint object, which is almost never what you want. So the, you want the Blueprint class, mostly. Uh, so that's why the asset manager has kind of like some wrappers to like avoid that weirdness of Blueprints. Uh... Here's some of those like um, report functions I mentioned. So like one of these goes through and like gives you like actually like a um, yeah yeah. So this this, this like gives, this one like gives you like a list of all the things referencing a package. So you can either like call you can either call that from a script or you could just have your own function defined in your own asset manager. Um, and down here are the virtuals you want to override. So like here's the one that gets called at the end of loading. Um, I mean, there's just a bunch of other functions. Like, here's like a modify cook function. Um, yeah, you can like directly override which chunk things go into if you want to do something weird. Uh, again, there's just a lot of functions in here. So once you are at the point where you've done the basic asset manager setup, and you have like your basic type setup, that's kind of a good time to like scan through this header and see if there's anything interesting you might be want to use for your setup. There's, there's a lot of functions. So. OK. Um, I think it's all the stuff I want to get through. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some water real fast. I think this might be a good time for Victor to sort of talk about Q&A. And I'll be back in one minute. For sure. Also time for me to address some of the audio issues I was having here. I was unable to speak throughout. Um, Ben's presentation, which was fine because he clearly doesn't need me helping out. Um, while Ben is getting some water, I guess I should switch this over and then I can let you all know that next week we're actually going to cover, we're going to do q and I'm not ending the stream here. I know this is usually what I say when we're in the stream, but um, uh, next week we're going to cover the chunk downloader. Michael Prinky is coming back for another live stream, uh, which is exciting. And um, yeah, I hope you're all excited about the MetaHuman Creator. Um, been sitting in that for a while and it is absolutely amazing um, what the team has been able to accomplish there. Uh, super excited about that. Um, I'm personally not very familiar with the asset manager and so I don't unfortunately have anything I can share with you right then or right there about it. Um, anything else new, cool and exciting? Let me take a look at the, um, the upcoming schedule for those of you who normally tune in. And I can give you a quick brief of what we have coming up on the channel in the next couple of weeks. 
one would think I know this by hand, but there's a lot going on to it. Um, so next week, we're covering the Chunk Downloader. A uh, week after that, we are actually bringing on a team from Germany called OnPoint, and they're going to talk about their virtual theater setup. So there's a little bit of um, virtual production going, uh, going on there. And then a week after that, um, we're doing simulation and training, which is going to be exciting. I also have NVIDIA covering DLSS in the future. Um, uh, I cannot hear you, Victor. That is because I am muted, and I'm going to tell Ben that. <laughs> I had to go through a couple of different, there we go. Um, I had to go through a little bit of an audio change setup that I discovered we had a problem when we started the stream because of the shift of which PC was actually hosting the stream. Um, I just want to verify that everyone can hear Ben now as well. I, can you all hear me on the stream? Yes, it looks good here, and we should no longer have you um, double uh, me streaming out twice. Thank yeah. you, chat. Good to see that everything is working as intended. Awesome. I was just covering a little bit what we we're going to show on the channel in the next coming weeks, but I think it's time for, uh, to cover a couple of the questions that we received so far. Yeah, absolutely. And I can kind of, one thing I will say, I'm not going to go into detail about the specific ways that Epic has used this in the past, sort of be more like more general, talking about like how games would use this or how games in general use this. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, start from the top. Uh, Matt Siog asked, is it possible to cook and build a specific chunk? For example, having a project with HTTP chunks enabled can be quite slow if you only want to update one chunk. Can you cook a single chunk? Um, cook and build I a specific one, yeah. I don't think you can do that, actually. Now, you can definitely write some custom code so you could like you could like modify the asset manager to uh, just skip everything in chunk zero. That be kind of like never cook stage, but I don't actually know if that'll work. One thing you can do, you can use the um, iterative cooking feature sometimes, but I wouldn't recommend doing that for like a like a real build. Like for real builds, you kind of want to cook everything from scratch because sometimes we have issues where like. The, pro the problem is that sometimes when you cook something, it actually kind of like changes it in ways that are kind of hard to predict. So it's better to better to cook everything the same. Um, but you can set things up so that you cook using a baseline, uh, which is similar to a DLC cook, like using like half the same options. Um, that will just try to make the data you put out as similar as possible to the original data. Uh, so the download will be small. You still need to cook the whole thing, but then the download will be much smaller. Brainshack asked, can the asset manager be used to group content for DLC and similar that can be downloaded on demand to keep package size small? Yeah, basically. So yeah, that's kind of building what, we just, what I just talked about. Uh, so the process of doing that is kind of hard to describe. Um, there, there's kind of two ways to do this. For most most games where you download things from like a, like a mobile game or so forth, you probably don't even want to use DLC. You probably just want to use the method I just talked about where you use a baseline package build and kind of make a patch off of that. Um, and then you would just ship, you would just ship like your chunk zero directly in your like download on like Google Play Store or something. And then your like chunk like one through 20 could be like stored on some other download server or using Google's system. But I don't, I don't know how that works. But the point is you can, for most games, you probably don't want to use DLC explicitly for things with lots of chunks. Uh, but if you are using DLC, you definitely can use chunks to set that up as well. Uh, but I've, I've not actually done that myself. So I've not tried to combine DLC with chunk assignment. I've heard from some licensees that this does work fine, uh, but I've not tried it because kind of the DLC cooking kind of like makes its own pack file anyway, which is separate from the chunk assignment system. Uh, so I, you, I think you probably want to use either chunk assignment or DLC, but I could be wrong about that. Next question comes from Willow Wolf, Willow Wolf One. 
Um, they ask, does the asset manager support saving slash loading per instance of item data? For example, a sort item that has a random stat range, plus one to 10, strength that must be saved per item instance. Uh, no, it is not. Uh, no, we don't have, the asset manager is designed to be used with editor assets. Uh, so, I mean, you can definitely, you can get pretty close with like, you know, blueprint inheritance gets you pretty close to that, but no, it does not save actual data. Um, one thing you might want to look at is the action RPG save game code in the sample. Uh, so that has a really simple inventory save in it. Uh, but that uses the asset manager to like get the list of all the items and like it saves an inventory by pointing to the primary asset ID. Uh, and then, you, then it would save like the random data on top of it. And then there's some code in there to like reconstruct those items for you. Uh, that's generally the way to go. There's not, the engine doesn't really have a built-in instance save and restore thing and built into it. I will go ahead and add for a simple version of that, we do have the simple UGC plugin that Chance Ivy covered on the last live stream last year. Um, that is a, an easier way to sort of continue to push DLCs, et cetera, because they can essentially be loaded as a mod. Um, and this is without the whole end user experience of being able to um, actually modify the game, but you can actually use that plugin um, to deliver content as a DLC. It will be called a mod in the back end, but for the end user, it will actually just be a, uh, um, a DLC. I will go ahead and link that in chat. Um, if you as just to mention in general, sometimes the code refers to mods and DLC is kind of interchangeably, uh, just because of who, you know, because historical reasons. But the, also like a DLC is, DLCs, mods, and plugins and are kind of all the same thing, depending on how you use them. Uh, so sometimes it might be a little confusing in the code. Yeah, it's, it's all about understanding it, right? Um, being able to work with it. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, uh, Ry Ryob G asked, how to avoid pulling in references when casting in blueprints? Soft loading usually causes return of generic objects, which needs to be casted and stored in member objects slash class references. How much is actually that nullifying the benefits of delayed and soft loading? Yeah, uh, so that's a, yes, that's a real issue. Um, let me construct an artificial example in the editor. Yeah, so let's go to this goblin. Okay, so we're going to add a soft reference. I'm oh, sorry. Um, this is kind of on the fly, so one second. Doing it live, folks. Yep. Yeah, here's, here's an example. So, so you do the async load here of all of the items. Uh, so yeah, if, if you have like an async load that, that does, so everything, everything up in here is fine, but then if you do like a cast here, cast to goblin uh, range one or whatever, yeah, yeah, so cast to goblin NPC level one. So this is bad. So even if this object was asynchronously loaded, uh, or this is a soft reference or whatever, if you every cast node just does, just, you have to have the full reference to it. Uh, so the general fix to this is you just never do that. You only ever cast to like, what's the, what's the parent class of goblin? Uh, BP enemy character. Right, so basically you just only ever cast to your base classes. Uh, and then usually base classes will uh, not have a lot of asset references in them. So if you go, so obviously this has a lot of functions in it. This has like variables, it has components, but the class defaults, um, I don't know, all the components out there. Yeah, yeah, so like here's like the mesh. So like in the base um, enemy character, there's no skeletal mesh set. Uh, so you want to do that as much as you can, where you have like an empty parent blueprint uh, that would have all the stuff you need, but then don't fill in things like skeletal mesh. And then in your child, your children, 
you know, you, then you end up setting skeletal mesh to this like actual grunt wing mesh. Uh, so this is kind of, I, I kind of go over this a little bit in the like using Blueprint and C++ documentation page, which I don't have a link for right now, but I can find one. Uh, but the point is you want to use Blueprint based classes everywhere. Uh, the other option you could use interfaces. So Blueprint interfaces can also be used for this. They have their own problems. I would recommend using base classes whenever you can. And then when you can't, because you have like, you know, if you have, if you have like a, you have a, you have like a, if you want to like interact with both an enemy character and like a chest, then you can't really have a base class because they're two totally different things. Then interfaces are better for that than casting to like some really low level thing. There's a, a great video uh, that, um, I believe Zach Parrish did a couple of years ago on blueprint communication. If you are unfamiliar with the different ways to communicate between blueprints, um, go check that out on YouTube. It has taught me a lot back in the day. Um, let's go on to the next one. Uh, I just want to say interfaces are absolutely fantastic. Um, Nat, Nat Rog 32 asked, what would be the best way to deal with a massive amount of spells slash abilities, perhaps thousands? Uh, this, this system scales up just fine to thousands, um, tens of thousands, fine. Um, the actual problem there is you need to have them be assets in the editor. Uh, so, but this, so there's a few ways to do that. Um, yeah, so, you know, obviously you, you, there could be literally just be a thousand weapons here. Um, at a certain point, you're probably going to want to write like an in-game tool, like a game-specific tool to create assets for you. Uh, you could use something like a, uh, I think the Blueprint Utility widgets can do that, I think. I've never tried that with them, but I think they can do that. Or you can write game-specific ones to do that. You could use that to like generate a bunch of things for you. That's one option. I don't recommend doing that unless you, I don't know, it depends on your game. Uh, the other key there is you're going to want to use Blueprint Inheritance at that point. Uh, so these are not Blueprints. No, these are, yeah, these are not Blueprints. Um, these are just um, pure data assets. But if you have, like a, you have like a really complicated hierarchy of like tens of thousands of items, you probably want Inheritance. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use data tables for that, which might be a better idea at the like, tens of thousands level. Because then you can like generate your data in like, an external tool, like a... Excel or even just like some custom thing, like custom JSON thing, and like import it as a data table. And then we, a lot of games do is one thing you can do that works really well is like mix and match blueprints and data tables. So you have like a generic weapon blueprint. Uh, and then like on the blueprint or on the data asset, whatever, you would like have a reference to a data table row here. Uh, and then you would pull like the stats out of the data table. So like, and then I'm mixing and matching, you can then say, here's a sword. So it has all the sword animations, but it actually uses a stats out of this data table. And I think that's a better way to get to like huge amounts of data in my, in my experience. All right. Next question comes from Chaos Spectrum. How would you search slash query primary assets during runtime slash in editor using gameplay tags? I like to use gameplay tags to mark my primary assets. Yeah, um, a few ways to do that. Let's go to code. Right. So this um, this code here. Um, so here's like the here's like the name example, right? Um, but you can just pull it. You can just pull it out as a raw string. You can pull everything out as a raw string. Uh, so you could have like string, and then then you know you you pull that pull the tag value into there. Um, sorry, now I'm doing that. And I'm pretty sure gameplay tags have a from export text on them, because this is something we actually do in some of the internal games. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, 
right. So you can just call this function and then pass in the export string. Uh, like. I'm pretty sure that'll work. So then you, you have a proper gameplay tag here. Uh, and then if it's in the, if it, this will only work if it's actually in the dictionary. Uh, but since it's in the dictionary, you can then use this tag to do whatever you want to. So you can set up like a runtime, you know, map from gameplay tag to primary asset ID or gameplay tag to asset data. Um, I'm actually kind of working on something for 427 that might help a little bit with this. Um, it's called the data registry that has like native tag support built into it. Uh, does not currently interact with the asset manager in this way, but I want to do it at some point. But yeah, it's a, it's a pretty common desire to have to want to go from gameplay tags to assets. And I think that's probably something we're going to we're gonna look at making like a real feature in the future, because I, I've had to write that at a few different times on different, different projects. So it seems like a pretty common thing that we should just do once somewhere. All right. Next question comes from, from Flasari. Is there a way or plan to make chunks addressable by string names instead of integers? There's definitely a plan. Um, yeah, uh, there's not a great way to do that just because of how it works. Chunk, chunks are stored at a very low level in the system where like, like, like space is at a premium. Um, yeah, there's a. There's not a great way to do that. I think you might end up wanting to do something um, that kind of like generates stuff for you from some description file, because uh, you could name the chunks after the like primary asset in them or something. Um, but that'd be game specific. So there's there's nothing built into the engine to do that. Uh, for for some games I've worked on, we can set it up so you can like have a separate description of like your top level structure, and then use that to like um, kind of override some of the get um, get chunk ID functions, because like on on asset manager, all the chunk functions can just be overwritten. So I. Yeah, it's like this function. You can override this, so you could like you could like have this go into your game specific thing, figure out, and then you know like figure out, oh, this is character Bob, and character Bob should go in chunk in chunk four, and then you could do a, do like a mapping there. Uh, so no, there's no way to do there's no way to do that in the engine, but that's also something that has come up a few different times. So it might be something we look at, but there's no plan for that though. Matsyog had another question. Um... Extending the U primary asset label with a new class breaks instances of the new class. They get ignored by the asset manager. Is it possible to extend it for adding some metadata for DLCs and stuff? I would have expected that to work. Um, asset labels are kind of treated like slightly weirdly. So there might be something specific to them where that doesn't work. That works fine for everything besides labels. Um, so that might just be a bug in the asset manager. Um, I've never tried that, so it's, it's, just, it's probably just a something we just doesn't work for no no good reason. That should work. So, I, and if you know if it's a simple change, that seems like something like a pull request that we that's, I would probably put a pull request if it's pretty simple. If not, maybe just describe the problem better somewhere. I'm not sure. Next question comes from Darkness FX. Can we use modify cook to split builds like ASTC only textures and materials for Android, ARM 64 v8, and ETC2 only texture materials for Android, ARM v7? Um, I think you probably want to use the other function in here, which is similar. So you do have some platforms of the control. You can change the chunk assignment here. So this, uh, this, these, these chunk functions do pass in the target platform. So the default doesn't do anything with them, but you can definitely do that. So you can strip out certain textures um, if you don't need them on a certain platform. 
Um, I think there's this simple override here, which just lets you exclude certain assets per platform. Um, yeah, so I think the way you, yeah, I think you, I think the way you do that is you the easy way to do that is to override the chunk assignment per platform. So you then you would shove all of the whatever format you care about textures into one chunk. And then at your packaging layer, you could just like say, don't package chunk five on iPhone or something. Um, I don't know how to do that super easily. There is one file that might help a little bit with that. I forget what it's called um, right now. No, it's not it. Hmm. I'm trying to remember. What I'm, I don't remember offhand. Uh, there's an INI file that also lets you assign um, non-packaged, non-asset data to chunks, uh, which you might need to do for like shaders and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if we have any examples doing that right now. This is another example of a thing that we should have a sample for, but don't. So it's definitely doable. Next question comes from Rima Ranch. Does primary asset bundle support TRA and TMAPs of soft, soft object pointers? Yes, that, that should all work just fine. Uh, I'm sure where that function is. So it just calls the primary data asset. It just calls this like generic function on the asset manager. So if you don't want to use primary data asset for some reason, you can just like override these like four functions in your base class and just that's all you need to do. Uh, but this generic function, I'm pretty sure handles arrays. Yeah, it does. So this it uses a property value iterator, uh, which actually will go into structs and arrays for you. So it doesn't matter where you put it. As long as it's a, as long as it's inside the same U object, it should get parsed out correctly. We have another question from Darkness FX. Can we use editor utilities plus asset manager or asset tools to automate editor tasks with edit and save assets data? Like set everything from one folder to a different chunk ID or apply new, ta new tags to assets? Uh, chunks, no, because the chunking system right now is more rule-based. Um, you could definitely write something to modify your INI file, but there's no way to do that from blueprints right now. I would say there's not super great support for blueprint editor utilities and the asset manager. I don't think there's much. There's some, there's some asset registry stuff, I'm pretty sure. Um, I, I mean, in my experience, we're just going to have to write C++ code at some point to do that kind of thing. Uh, I feel like when it comes to things that are for packaging and shipping, um, you're going to be in C++ eventually. Uh, so there hasn't been a lot of effort to support packaging, shipping stuff in Blueprint Editor utilities. Next question comes from Henry Liu. Is is that possible to hold some assets which we do not want to be unloaded during change map? For example, a bunch of textures. Yeah, totally. So that, that's where the, the preload is useful. Uh, so actually, if you just call, if you just do like this preload primary assets, there's also just like a function on the asset manager, which just gives you a stream. Load asset list. Uh, so you can just pass in like a bunch of soft object paths here, um, and this is be able. So if you just, if you figure out what all the textures are, you could just like use this and just and then just if you sorry, start to go a little slower on this one. It's complicated. Uh, you figure out what you want to load, pass it in here, uh, and then just hold this handle around. So put it under game instance or somewhere, and as long as this handle is around, those textures will not get garbage collected on the map transition. This is also it's really useful if you're doing like a reload. So like if you die and want to reload a checkpoint, uh, this is another very useful thing to do in that case. Uh, so it's, it doesn't matter that these assets are already loaded. That's fine. Uh, 
So you just you just kind of ignore the delegate. You don't even have to you don't have to pass in a delegate. So you just load it and then just keep this handle, and then you could do exactly that. Or you could do something with bundles. That's what I was talking about bundles, where you could set up like a map primary asset and have like a bundle that has like all the textures it needs. That's more complicated, but it's kind of the same idea though. You like figure out what textures to assign to it, and then you could like override the bundle functions to like assign it to it. Next question comes from Cyberwolf755. How would you cook assets and load them from a server for a finished game? Does UE4 support downloading natively? For a server? Um, no, I don't think there's any support for server-side downloading and anything we've shipped. So the maybe you could, you could possibly use the Chunk Downloader plugin, but I haven't tried to do that on the server. Um, it may be possible. Uh, yeah, that, no, I, I don't know of a good way to do that. I will, this is a long shot, but I will try to do a shout out to one of the teams in the 2019 Epic Mega Jam who's actually submitted a game um, for the jam that had a downloader built into it. Um, they were very clever about that because it, um, they were trying to get around one of the special modifier category requirements. Um, so we are clever. If you are watching or it might be in the future, it would be great. I think, I think those folks actually wrote up something about that, and I am just not sure where that lies. Um, but they were able to do it for um, the Mega Jam, so I definitely know it's possible. 100% uh, custom, though, as far as I know. Um, Chaos Spectrum had another question for us. I have a couple of things derived for a primary asset. Item to world to weapon to ranged. If I have a custom asset type or ranged, I get a warning. Is this just a limitation? I don't understand that question. So uh, chaos is, I, that might be a better one for some text later. So maybe post that on, uh, that's a good time for, for a good um, plug. Um, the, the Unreal Slackers Discord has some pretty good channels for like C++ and more advanced stuff. Uh, so some of these more advanced questions might be better off just doing over there. We can also discuss them in the forum announcement post for this yeah, live stream yeah. on our forums, and then it's a little easier to search for it um, once the conversation has happened. Uh, but Slackers is a great place to sort of discuss and hash things out uh, in more real time, which is a little different from the forums. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Ben, I'll make sure to send you the questions after the stream as well, and you can go ahead and, and tackle them um, when you have some time. Yeah, actually, yeah, build on that. So, so I'll make sure to check the announcement thread a few times this week. I mean, I won't check it forever, but if you do post like specific things, I will definitely take a look at them and I'll answer them if I know them, if I can. So. I will check it forever because I get notifications every time someone writes there. <laughs> so Ben, if there's something that comes up, I will let you know. Sure. Um, let's see. Cyberwolf had another question. Does patching a game mean swapping the changed chunks? So for example, if a game didn't make enough chunks or any or any, it would result in larger updates. An example being Mortal Kombat 11 uh, that had a PC patch the size of the whole game. Yeah, there's a few things there. Uh, I, I don't know what their patch, I'm, I'm not gonna speculate about what their patching architecture is like, but the full size downloads are often because if you're not building with a baseline release build, uh, especially on older versions of the engine, it would do a pretty bad job of like lining things up. Um, I think it does a better job now by default, but it also does a much better job if you use the baseline. Um, so that should be, that just should be better in the more recent versions of the engine. Uh, but it is true that if you like rearrange your chunks massively, like if you switch from like, if you just like move everything in chunk one to chunk two, move everything in chunk two to chunk one, you're gonna have to re-download everything if you do that. So. You want to get your chunk assignments figured out kind of before you release for real. Like, I mean, you know, end of early access or like, you know, late data, that kind of thing is when you want to finalize it because you don't really want to change it after you have like a lot of people downloading it. Let's see, Saxhack asked, does this work with the Google Pad plugin? I have no idea what that is. Me so. neither, actually. I've never heard of that plugin. Yeah, that might be the DLC one. Yeah. Um, there's not really native integration with this stuff, but it, 
again, you, this just makes the correct staged files for you. And then the staging to like delivery is all very platform specific. Uh, and it, it, there's not really a unified way to do that. So it's all very different depending on the platform. I spam for food ask on a data asset. Can, can we soft load them and access something like a struct? Example being, I have a data set with conditions. I want to access the conditions without fully loading the data asset. Yeah, you do something similar to what I just did for the gameplay tag example. Uh, so this from export string uh, on gameplay tag basically does that for you. So if you were to tag an entire structure as um, asset registry searchable, pretty sure it writes out the whole structure. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And then you can just kind of, you have to use this weird import text thing. Uh, but import text basically, this is the syntax you get when you like copy paste things in the editor basically. Uh, so it uses that syntax. So you can have whatever you want to in there. So you, you can totally just have like a rule structure in your asset registry data and then pull it out with this import text. This will be kind of slow though, especially if you have like a lot of these. So. Sniper Echo asked, I'm working on a project and currently exploring how to implement Delta patching. Is this a viable replacement to Delta patching? I, no, this, again, this builds into that. So you would use, you want your, as long as you have your chunk set up the same before and after with the Delta patch, uh, then it will just apply, it will do a Delta patch for each of the chunks. So no, it's a complement to the Delta patch. Sion Shivak had a pretty good question here. Could you lend some insight into using primary de data asset references outside of the engine? For example, a backend service with persistent inventory. Would storing the, str yeah. would storing the string like primary asset ID in the database be appropriate? Yes, that is actually one of the reasons we came up with that. I left it off my slides, but yes, that's absolutely what they're designed for. Um, because they're shorter, so you don't want to do the full path I mean, you can if you want. So you, you, you could override this to use the full path as the primary one if you wanted to. But in my experience, designers like to move things between directories more than they like to move things, rename them. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually set it up in your game so that it like, keeps the primary asset consistent over time. So you could like override some of these functions. There's also like a, there's also just like a, um, there's a simple redirector in the settings, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, so these primary asset ID redirects, that's literally for this exact case where you have like a database where you store everything as like weapon.axe and then you decided to call it weapon.axe4, then you could like set up a remapping here. Uh, and there's some functions on the asset manager that let you like do that re remapping. And this is, we have a little bit of time. There's a question here that's sort of on topic, but I figure we can address it. Um, okay. What was that? Yes, go ahead. Um, sorry for the bad puns asked, what are the kinds of problems associated with using interfaces instead of blueprints to avoid hard asset references? I think what they're referring to using blueprints uh, or sorry, interfaces instead of casting and- The base classes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it kind of comes down to, there's a few reasons for that. Um, and load reasons times. For that. Yeah, load times is the big one that I came across. Well, I think, I think he's asking more about uh, interfaces versus base classes, because those are the two options. Ooh, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. So, um, base classes are just a little easier to use because you don't need to have like a, you don't need to like expose things in both the interface and the base class. If you have a base class, it makes sense. You just do it in one place. Interfaces are a little slower, like performance wise in some cases. Um, also, it's harder to have an interface that works in both C++ and Blueprints. So if you, if you want to have like things that are, if you want to have your base classes be in native code, and use from blueprints. Base classes are currently easier than interfaces for a variety of reasons that are not worth going into. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my general advice is use base classes when it makes sense. And then when it doesn't make sense, use interfaces. I especially like to use interfaces when 
I have similar functions and I don't want um, different actors to have the same base class because they are vastly different, but I still need to know how much health does this have or um, any of the other typical re results. Uh, being mm -hmm. able to return that data and essentially call a function on a class that you don't actually have a reference to is extremely useful, um, especially during prototype phases when you're not sure about the entire hierarchy of all of the uh, classes that you'll actually be shipping with the game. Yep. Yeah, yeah, totally. That, that, that's kind of the big thing, right? So if it's, so like all, pretty, I, basically every game should have like a base character class that's like game specific. Like I think pretty much every game ends up doing this. So like that, that's a pretty natural place to put some of those like general functions. Uh, but yeah, you can't, it doesn't really make any sense to have like vehic vehicles and characters can't be the same base class really. So like there's stuff like that where you, you can't be, you, interfaces make way more sense for those. Yeah, in the end it, you know, we always talk about performance and ways to manage it, but the, one of the most important things is that it is all, uh, that you can work with it as a human, right? And understand what's going on. And so occasionally you can pay a little bit of the performance cost and take some of the manageability of the system um, over that performance cost, but always run your um, profilers to make sure that it's the right choice. Um, that was our last question. I think we went through all of them. Yeah, it was the, another one about the Google plugin, which unfortunately we're not aware. Um, maybe we can provide some information on that later. Um, with that said, Ben, is there anything else you want to leave chat with before we um, sign off here today? Yeah, I think so. Um, a few things. So I was thinking, I think I probably want to write up some of this in an informal form. I, I might throw this on the UE4 community wiki at some point. Uh, so in, for people who don't like to read vi video, you know, people who don't want to watch a whole video to get some of the details out of it. Uh, so I'm probably going to write up something in the next few days, put it there. I'll link that in the forum thread if um, once I do that. Yeah, I'll put it in the OP as well. Yeah, but like also, yeah, I mean, just like in general, in general, a lot of these systems are designed as kind of like a toolbox to be used by moderately, these systems are mostly designed for like moderately experienced programmers. Like if you're like a super experienced programmer, you've either already found this or you have your own way of doing this. Uh, but if you're, like a, if you're like a brand new programmer, this might be a little, might not be ready for that. Uh, but like it's a good moderate experienced programmer. So because of that, it doesn't do a lot of things like all the way for you. The system is designed to do things like 95% of the way for your game. So think about that when you look into the systems and like are looking at the headers and stuff. Like it's designed to be a toolbox more than it is like a all-in-one solution. Um, I think it's really the only thing I wanted to say. Yeah, so like I, I um, just pulled my who am I slide, I guess, to end on. Yeah, so um, you can poke me, actually, you can poke me on Twitter if you want. I, I think that'll work. Um, or, or obviously on the, uh, the forum thread's great. Um, yeah, and um, this is the kind of, I usually think about this stuff fairly often. So there's a lot of interesting areas of combining gameplay and engine-y stuff, so. And then like I mentioned, Unreal Slackers has good discussions about that sometimes. So those are all different ways to get in contact with me if you want. Um, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say on my side. Awesome. Well, with that said, I do want to let everyone know that if you thought that we there was a lot of content and you wasn't really sure where we discussed something and you want to go back and watch the VOD, um, within a couple of days after the video, uh, we didn't stream to YouTube today, unfortunately, uh, but the VOD will go up on YouTube and we timestamp all of the Inside Unreal episodes uh, so that it makes it a little easier for you to find um, the section that you might be looking for. Um, within about a week of the upload on YouTube, we also provide captions for the entire stream. Um, we also upload a link to the full transcript with timestamps on it. So that's also another way that you can go in, uh, download the uh, transcript, control F, uh, search for your key terms, and then find the timestamps where we discuss those specifically. Um, make sure you follow us on uh, Twitter and all of our social media accounts. That's where all the great news um, will be um, announced first, um, as well as the, our live streams, uh, future online events that we'll be doing this year, um, as well as all of the uh, live streams. An even earlier look at the live streams coming up, you can find in the events section on the Unreal Engine forums. Um, 
If you enjoy our content, make sure you hit that follow on Twitch. And if you are streaming Unreal Engine content, there's actually an Unreal Engine tag that you can use, which makes it a little bit easier for us and others to find you and your content. I usually combine the Unreal Engine tag together with the game development tag, um, and then you can search for filters using those, which is uh, pretty handy. Um, next week, we're going to have Michael Prinky covering the chunk downloader, which is somewhat... Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, <laughs> somewhat relevant. Uh, thankfully, he was nice enough to uh, come on a little bit of last notice. Uh, so I'm excited for that. Um, that news might go out Monday, Tuesday, um, but he will be on next Thursday on our regular time, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, that said, thank you so much, Ben, for coming on and talking to us and explaining about the Asset Manager. Um, and thanks to KS Spectrum, who um, reminded me that this was a topic that we hadn't covered yet on the live stream. Uh, so big shout out. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, I, yep, I was really glad to talk through some of this stuff. Um, yeah, it's, thank you for hosting me. It was a good, good experience. For sure. Um, if we have any future updates to the Asset Manager, um, please let me know, Ben, and then we'll make sure to uh, bring you back on the stream again. With that said, I hope you all are staying safe out there. Um, we will see you again next week, same time. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.